Hello, everybody, and welcome to Agriculture Going Green, Changing the Food Chain and Halting Disforestation. Um, we're so excited to be here with everybody today and answer all your questions and share our thoughts. recently talking to you either individual or together so much so much more because as you know like my background is more like refrigeration and solar so learning about the amazon and deforestation you guys have taught me so much and it's amazing i just things that i don't know and what i love about it is the awareness that we want to share with everybody else and answer any questions that people have so thank you edgar mariana jonah helena um we're all going to go around we're going to let jonah start and share about what you're doing in your beliefs. Great. Thanks so much, Jonathan. My name is Jonah Wickcamper. In preparation for this session, I created a shared Google Doc, which you can get to at tinyurl.com slash ag, A-G, all lowercase. Uh, I lead an organization called the Amazon Investor Coalition or the Amazon Rainforest Investor Coalition. It was launched in September of last year. It has a four part strategy to advance forest friendly economic development and the rule of law across the nine Amazon countries of South America. Uh, the background is 20 years ago, I co-founded a global association of youth organizations. And then I co-founded a global network of young wealth holders called Nexus and built that to 6,000 members mm -hmm. and then created the Global Governance Philanthropy Network to uh, facilitate platforms for cross-generation collaboration on philanthropy and global governance reform. And we discovered that we need to secure the ecological integrity of the Amazon rainforest. Otherwise, it's game over for climate. Uh, it's uh, game over for stabilizing global weather patterns. The Amazon rainforest is very near a deforestation tipping point. In fact, the dry season just south of the Amazon is now a month longer than it used to be. And beyond that tipping point, the southern half of the forest is going to die back and there will be huge amounts of carbon emitted into the atmosphere and rain patterns will be radically disrupted. 70% of the GDP of South America depends on the rain patterns that propagate from the Amazon. And somewhere between 30 and 40% uh, percent of the rainfall in the Sierra Nevada mountains of the United States come from the Amazon region. That's a huge breadbasket for the United States. And that's just the tip of the iceberg. So, we need to secure the ecological integrity of that region um, or else. And so I'm organizing investors and philanthropists globally in that task. And we have four strategies. One is about impact investing. We need to scale as much impact investing across the region as possible. So we're working on a report. We want to understand how much money is flowing into the region, to what industries, and what are the stumbling blocks. The second strategy is about the rule of law. You can't have forest-friendly economic development without a healthy rule of law. We've identified 26 different strategies that bilateral agencies and grant makers are investing in to help secure governance, healthy governance, and rule of law for the Amazon region. They range from training law enforcement to using satellites for forest monitoring. Those details are laid out in the legal strategies section of our website, amazoninvestor.org. Our third strategy is about carbon innovation. That means both ecosystem service payments and carbon markets. California in 2019 um, signed the deal on the California Tropical Forest Standard. It is a mechanism that has been endorsed by indigenous communities to match carbon money with forest conservation across different state level governments in the South American region. It hasn't been plugged yet 
into California's carbon market, but it's just a matter of time. We need state level advocacy to make that happen in California. And we need to recreate the California Tropical Forces Standard in, in as many subnational government contexts as possible. Uh, there are many other details that are laid out on the website. The last strategy is about investor education. So Nexus, this global network of young wealth owners I created, has young people from uh, over 150 billionaire families in it. We've managed to convince dozens, maybe up to 50 banks and multifamily offices to organize delegations of young people from their client families to our events around the world. We have a huge amount of access and influence, but it's a non-solicitation network. So it's not about shaking people down for money. It's about creating opportunities and context for learning how to use money for impact. We're going to use the access that that network provides us to knock on the doors of the global capital markets and say to the world, the sovereign wealth funds, the pension funds, the Amazon needs you. And here's how to help. Those strategies are outlined on amazoninvestor.org. Thanks. Wonderful. Thank you. I was going to ask you to explain about Nexus, but you beat me to it. Uh, I'm based on the south of Minas Gerais state. I'm daughter of farmers and I founded an ag tech startup called AgroSmart. And we monitor crops with sensors and imagery, uh, even in places where infrastructure is very little. So there is usually no internet in the field. And we use that data into generating insights for the farmers to act better in a day to day basis. It's like we help them to have a more precise weather forecast. We predict diseases. We help them to irrigate better. So like everything that we, they can do so they can produce more and at the same time in a more sustainable way. And we also engage the whole supply chain. So we work with input companies in their R&D, like in order to understand how they can place better their products. We work with food chain companies uh, in their sourcing strategy where they usually source from smallholder farmers. So we help the farmers in that chain to become more climate resilient and then the, the corporations to report on their KPIs on carbon footprint, water footprint, and so on. And lastly, we support banks and insurance companies to mitigate their risk and create cheaper and more accessible financial products for the farmers. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, we're going to get back to all of that because there's so much amazing information. And I really want people to know also how COVID has affected everybody and what we could do to move forward. Helena, would you like to share now? Sure. Um, so my name is Helen Papper, and I... Um, I'm very happy to, to be here and, and to listen to um, to a lot of this dialogue that's going on, not just here in this panel, but I think it's extremely important um, for us to be sharing our thoughts and, and the experience that's, uh, that's just been echoed by my um, two colleagues here. So I work currently for the International Fund for Agricultural Development to the UN Specialized Agency, but I've spent the last um, 20 years working in the most vulnerable areas of the world, in the most rural areas of the world, and trying to figure out ways uh, to make sure that solutions coming from local communities were actually brought up to the national and international levels uh, to, to create that kind of global engagement and ensure sustainable solutions. And that's just starting right now to hit the global agendas, the top agendas, and, and, and um, countries around the world are starting to realize that it's one thing to be able to work politically and to create spaces um, diplomatically to look for solutions. And that's been the 20th century, right? But then to next step is to make sure that we're engaging local populations. It can't be either or, and it needs to start there. And, you know, before I go go more into that, because I could talk about that forever, um, if you go back to the topic that brings us together here, and where we're looking at really the topic of the year, which is climate change, which is how that affects um, food systems, how that affects our livelihoods today, and we were bringing that back to forests and wetlands, which is um, something that we're particularly working on, right? I mean, we know that the Northern Hemisphere um, has been characterized by unusually high temperatures and wildfires in many countries, that over the past 25 years, world's forest area have declined by 4.1 billion hectares to just 4 billion hectares. That's a decrease of over 3%. 
and uh, no less urgent, right, given the, the alarming rise in temperatures and wildfires, forests uh, will be uh, more able to sustain their historic role as sinks for atmospheric um, carbon dioxide. And then wetlands uh, are disappearing three times faster than forests. We have both inland marine coastal wetlands decreasing, uh, decreased by around 35% uh, where data is available, three times the rate of forest lost. Um, it's covering around four to six percent of the world's surface. They contribute to climate regulation, support ecosystems and biodiversity. So these are extremely important. But then how do you bring that to back to local populations? Right. And what do you look at in terms of solutions? One of the, the, the topics that we we were supposed that, that, that was mentioned today was agritech. Um, it's one of the questions that is it a sustainable way um, and a sustainable solution in terms of looking at the use of forest resources and protection of wetlands. And by leveraging the tools that, for instance, today, internet marketing companies have already honed to reach consumers, governments can deliver quality agronomy advice at scale, even during a pandemic. Digital technologies have long been launched, um, lauded as the solution. Uh, we have you know, quite a lot of case studies going on driving agritech adoption insights, for instance, from Southeast Asia's farmers who have used IT tool expert agronomists um, to share useful techniques with farmers on everything from planting to pest scouting to harvesting techniques. And har farmers actually told us they value advice that have been tested by neighboring farmers much more than the views of a distant and unknown expert. Um, we have pathways to getting messaging into these groups through power users, through more experienced farmers and retailers who provide leadership within the group. And these people reach outside the peer groups to using, you know, YouTube and Google now to find relevant information. Then they circulate it to others in the group. We have ways in the end to use agritech to find solution. When we're talking about sustainable use of forest resources, for instance, it's also possible to balance local economic needs with positive environmental impacts, but to make sure that these solutions are leveraged through dialogue and using the modern technology to do that. So, and I'm really going over quite quickly because I could go into to case studies and to details on this, but really what's important here is the reason I'm mentioning this is because I really believe that it's important for us to creatively look at modern technology and modern solutions adapted to local realities, even in the most remote areas of our worlds, to make sure that we look together for solutions from the ground. I spent four years living in South Sudan. I spent years living in Mali in the most remote areas. And even their technology, the use of radio, for instance, I set up peace, uh, peacekeeping radios, but the, ra the radio stations and the um, way of using these radio stations with modern technology to ensure that populations were able to engage in dialogue, that they felt recognized in their own struggles, trying to figure out how they were going to have a sustainable future for themselves when they were re realizing that climate change was no longer enabling them to provide for their families. And therefore, because of that, they were easily being drawn into conflict. And that by being there and by listening to them, by rehumanizing and making them part of the solution going forward, they felt empowered. They felt that there was a possibility of moving forward, ensuring that they had solutions through technical solutions but, and through experts to be able to help them face climate change, face the, the, the issues that they were handling to be able to adapt their livelihoods so that they could say, we are strong, we do not have to revert to conflict. And I've seen it with my own, own eyes. And I do know that if we work on this together, we can um, make sure that we are shifting from diplomatic solutions, which are important, and political solutions to actually more of a down to top approach. If we don't go back to the origins, right, to rural development and sustainable development as a way to address what we need today, which is rethinking our food systems, rethinking food security, and understanding that it's a domino effect. It starts from rural development, from agriculture, from greening agriculture, 
ensuring that that is adapted to local solutions and that is therefore will impact directly the farming healthy and nutritious livelihoods which will then impact the health of our planet which will impact sustainability and regenerative solutions which will then enable us to be globally resilient right so i really do think that this domino effect is extremely important and that is how we will meet the 2030 agenda and the global goals that the united nations is working working so far on so you know Again, um, I'm sure we'll, we'll come back to this and, and, and to, to look more specifically at the food systems um, this year. But I, I just wanted to make sure that we, you know, we, we look through the gamut of how this topic relates to, to global resilience. Thanks. Right. Wonderful. Just real quick, will you explain so people understand what agritech is? Because it's not well, a word I, that you use quite a bit. Yeah, I think, I mean, agritech is really, in, in a nutshell, it's really looking at how technology use is, is leveraged for agricultural purposes and for strengthening agricultural uh, practices um, and bringing those two together. So the thinking behind um, technology and, and making sure that that is used in particular, in, in, and I'm not an, um, the, the, you know, the expert on all of agritech, but using the, the technological solutions to ensure that, for instance, we have solutions that are getting to the right areas um, and that communities can engage in them to, to, to create that dialogue and the information sharing that is necessary is really what helps us move on to the next level. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Edgar, now to you, my friend. Thank you, Jonathan. Good morning, everyone from the Philippines, where I am speaking from at the moment. Um, adequately substantial has been spoken uh, by my uh, fellow panelists. And very true indeed. Uh, what is happening in the case of the Amazon and other parts of the world uh, also has its own representation in the Philippines. As a matter of fact, uh, before Jonathan asked, what is the meaning of Paglas, which is the name of my affiliation that is registered here? It is just a small, very small community with about 30,000 people total. It is along what we call uh, Liguasan Mars. It is a marshland, uh, about 200,000 hectares. And what is written about or reported about the Amazon and other parts of the world is also happening in its own version in this community. Um, I represent a commercial endeavor. It is a banana plantation. As a matter of fact, it is affiliated with a global brand called Chiquita. So we market to Japan in that brand. And while people owe their livelihood to the commercial operation, to the banana plantation, it's about 2,000 Less, almost 2,000 hectares, employing about 4,000 people. They are so careful about the usage of pesticides and chemicals, which is really a characteristic of anything that you do intensive, uh, a better world. Now we have words like factory agriculture, uh, whether it's in livestock or in plants. When you use the word intensive, that really means it's a bully. The crop is a bully, you know. Just use chemicals to remove the weeds that are just trying to so-called make a living. They grow there because food is there. And as a matter of balance, the whole uh, environment benefits. But then we, uh, I'm pointing to myself now as the commercial uh, investor, feel threatened by those weeds because I'm planting banana. Why are those other plants there? But then I forgot, and uh, that's why I keep on coming back to that word, the spirit of the area, the spirit of the Amazon, the spirit of the marshland, the spirit of the Arctic and the Antarctic, you know. So what's happening in the Amazon in its own unique version also is happening in its own story in, out there in those massive uh, uh, glaciers. So... I was pointing out earlier, uh, Jonathan, uh, when we were having a chat about um, how important to my own observation as a commercial locator, trying just try to make money as a businessman, uh, uh, what type of a businessman I am, that's also another, another story. Um, do I really care 
I claim to care about my environment. I have to have that in my uh, right. annual report. But then, is it really? Is it really uh, the depth of that word caring for that environment? To my day-to-day -day life, again as a businessman, I mean, am I using chemicals that just kill everything else and leave the banana plant alive? Um, but nature has its own way of taking revenge, as they say. Whether we believe it or not, we are experiencing it anyway. No matter how well we, the word agri-tech was mentioned. And yeah, uh, as an organization, we do say we have sophistication in our uh, practices. Um, the engineering system, the fertilization, the test, uh, test control, poor insects, they're called pests. Uh, but they're, again, they're part of that ecosystem as we are now learning. And they say, when nature takes its own revenge, then we end up with famine and, uh, I mean, famine because induced by these massive infestations that cannot be controlled. They just happen overnight, wake up the following morning, the army worms had eaten all your plants. That kind of that kind of thing. So, the community is very important. Uh, no matter how responsible the the the, the, the bigger entity, <laughs> as we call ourselves, the business. No matter how how big we are or important we are, if we do not have that. Um, support from the community, then it's still useless. I may have spoken uh, beyond what I should, but uh, that's my take on this. Thank you. Okay. Let's talk about deforestation because that's what our main topic's about, and we really haven't pushed on that and how it's affecting the Amazon. Who would like to lead that conversation? Jonah? I'm happy to start. Okay. Um, so I've just pasted an article that I wrote with a couple of people. Since the 1970s, about 70 million hectares of the Brazilian Amazon has been deforested, primarily for the scaling of cattle pasture and uh, soy. Uh, it, about 10 years ago, there was a moratorium on de uh, soy that came from deforested lands and, uh, and soy production got pushed over to the Cerrado biome in Brazil. Um, the, this, uh, and, and this deforestation related to uh, pressure from cattle expansion continues. Um, it's actually cheaper uh, and more profitable to intensify cattle production than it is to simply cut down new forests. It takes a lot of work to go and cut down a forest. Um, but some of the things that prevent intensification um, are capital costs. These are some things that Mariana can probably talk about in more detail than me. There are a couple of interesting things that are outlined in this article. So cattle earns Amazon, Amazonian farmers about $250 per hectare per year. And soy earns Amazonian farmers about $1,000 per hectare per year. But mahogany, African mahogany, can earn farmers, if, if you have a 20 hectare plot and you only cut one hectare on a 20 year cycle, uh, it can earn Amazonian farmers $8,000 per hectare per year. And it's much healthier for the environment. It sequesters carbon, uh, it puts down deep roots, it regenerates the soil, um, it doesn't allow for this desertification process that's going on. It keeps, it restores the, for, the canopy cover and the transpiration rates return and we won't be facing that Amazon deforestation tipping point. But who can tolerate that that 20 year delay? There are a lot of other crops you can pace that you can plant along the way, like pepper and bananas. Those are sort of transition crops. Uh, coffee and cocoa and sustainable rubber. There are many other things that fit in. Also acai and kupuasu and tons of other amazing Amazonian superfruits that you've never heard of. What's sustainable and bad for the ecosystem back towards uh, native species. Um, we ran some numbers. On average, a hectare of polyculture agroforestry could produce 3,500 
uh, dollars per year. So that if you literally take these 53, uh, it's, it's 45 million hectares of cattle and 8 million hectares of soy. If you replace it with this sort of average agroforestry polyculture, instead of just bringing the region $19 billion per year, which is what those existing things bring Amazonian farmers, it would bring to the region $175 billion per year. So restoring and saving the Amazon can actually be far more profitable than the business as usual uh, activity that we're going on that's going on now. Um, so why isn't everybody engaging in this? There are a couple of stumbling blocks. It's not just delayed profitability. Some of these plants also suffer from diseases. Uh, uh, some of the market demand doesn't exist. There are a whole bunch of other things that are actually easily overcome with a little bit of research, a little bit of philanthropy, and a little bit of manufactured demand. Uh, many of the details are laid out in that article. So there are just a couple of statistics and solutions on Amazon deforestation. All right, Mariana, we'd like to hear from you because you deal with the farmers in the Amazon all the time. What do you think about deforestation and what we need to do? I think it's a big issue. And I think the first step was concluded that it was to create awareness, right? So I think like in the past, people didn't even know about it. No one knew what was going on in Amazon. It's like it's another world, right? So like I think a lot of activism and engagement lately has shown what's going on there. And on and the another step that we managed to do is like to differentiate that is not necessarily a problem with agriculture, because there is good agriculture. You no, know? and the problem of Amazonia is not agriculture, but it's illegal deforestation and agriculture made wrong. So one thing that Brazil really needs to work on, and there is a huge pressure for it, is in disincentivize the amount of deforestation there. And of course, just as Jonah mentioned, uh, incentivizing the, the adoption of regenerative agriculture and, and different crops in the region. And the difficulties that we find uh, on regenerative agriculture is scalability, right? And how to spread the knowledge and how to make it work and scale as we are still working on improving the traditional agronomy model, like how to use data to make it more efficient and more sustainable, when we go to integration of forest, cattle, and plants, and using the regenerative model, there's so much to learn. There's still so much to be, to, to be built. And that's where I think there's a huge opportunity for leapfrogging, because it can start correctly. And that's where I think ag techs come into place. It's like in using technology to learn faster, to understand better, better the correlation of the environment and then to accelerate the replication of those models and, and make it scalable. So we recently partnered with, uh, with another NGO and they're also becoming a startup now called Renature. So they, like, they, uh, they work directly with cocoa, coffee products in the Amazonia. And we are working together where we provide the technology that we have been using in traditional ag so we can help them learn faster and prove faster, uh, me metrify the impact and prove return on investment because there is return on investment. And that's where I think the mind sh mindset shift is because farmers in Brazil, they learned and they're in, like little by little, everyone learning that it's good to be sustainable. That is not only like something to be green or something for the environment. No, you have a premium market. Now you have carbon markets being regulated and that's a way where they can monetize over that. So I think there is an awareness shift especially after the pandemic because there was a lot of pressure and a lot of push on the digitalization for other reasons because you lack labor and other stuff so i am happy to be leaving that moment in transi transitioning that agriculture and i see a bright future for for we seeing um, an amazonia protected and productive all right helen i have a question for you because this is your expertise of getting awareness out there getting giving people a voice where do we go from here well, I think we go from from awareness and advocacy to then the, the next step, which is concrete solutions. But I think that what you've just heard is exactly what we need to scale up is the importance that actually this 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 awareness, this education, this dialogue with the farmers, whether you're using technology, whether you're making sure that they're getting 
the newest information possible so that they can then adapt it to their own necessities to become sustainable, to become regenerative. I mean, that's more and more of a word that we're using, right? Um, as we as we start looking into the future, we've heard about sustainability for such a long time. Um, and now we're, we're shifting also into the need to not only be sustainable, but regenerative. We heard um, our, our experts here talk about these major crops, you know, this over this monoculture of crops that are actually tremendously bad for the global, you know, for, for, for the environment and that we need to go back to local productions, local, and we need to diversify. If we don't diversify, that's going to, you know, kill the, the future of agriculture. But that information, it needs to circulate. And people need to own it and they need to really understand how it relates to them, how it relates to their capacity to um, sustain, to, to have access to basic services for themselves, right? We were talking earlier uh, offline about really what moves people. It's the basic necessity to survive, right? We need to first survive, then create a survival network for our families. Then we can start listening to others. And if we don't feel listened, wherever we are, how can we listen to others who are trying to tell us or not what is, you know, what can, what can support us in the future? And there's, that's really, we need to go back to that basis of reshifting mentalities, relearning how to communicate and talk to each other and understanding that if that's not done, whatever technology brings us, whatever, you know, the, the, the big research industries um, bring to our table, they're not going to be, um, they're not going to be embraced, and they're not going to be then used for for the benefit of the communities because it doesn't relate to them. And so, if it doesn't relate to you, then you can't relate it back. You can have as many people tell you here, this is what you wanted, what you should do, but until it actually means something to you, it's not going to be helpful, right? Yeah. And that's how, that's exactly how social media is working today. That's exactly how the, the world of information is working today because they get it. So they know how to exactly hone into what is going to, to pique your interest, whether it's good or not, whether it's positive or not. So we need to use that power of communication for good with, with uh, and, and really going back to the roots of communication is education, is action, is change. We are all actors of change. We can all be actors of change. When I worked in, 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 in the Amazon in particular with indigenous communities to ensure that they themselves started having a voice and that their ancestral knowledge became part of a dialogue that could be raised up, especially in, in, in our, I spent um, quite a bit of time in Ecuador. Um, it was a struggle, but the fact that you could be listened to and that it wasn't just for the benefit of somebody else right because indigenous populations have a very specific way of working and uh, and and you know they don't let they, they, they don't like they, nobody likes to be exploited but they are very particular in terms of how they're going to share their knowledge but you know creating that engagement and making sure that they're particular knowledge of their earth, their agriculture was actually used and starting to be used in terms of generating an impact around the world is extremely important. So, you know, I do think that that needs to be part of this, um, these discussions that we're having is making sure that we go back to the roots of sharing and information. All right. And Edgar, have you seen anything uh, change in the Philippines? deforestation and stuff like that. You're muted. Yeah, you're muted. We can't hear you. Very sorry about that. Yeah. Not a problem. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah. The Philippines has long been deforested. Uh, when there was this um, lagging boom, as it was called, brought money to the industry, to the lagging industry in the 1970s, everybody was just cutting the forest. But of course, we didn't see the effect of that. The rivers continued to be, uh, it's a, it's a um, stable. Uh, flash flooding was not yet a word in the Philippines back then. It will take time, you know, as soon as the forests, the, the original growth, the big logs are 
cut, then the small farmers come in. What do they know about small farming? Uh, the way they, it's been during the time of their ancestors, having small patches of land to plant corn, uh, it's not really damaging. But when commercial activities set in, that's when the, the, the soil cover is lost. Again, I just mentioned earlier about how we do it in our banana plantation. And every day after 20 years, I've called it a bully crop, monoculture. Uh, no offense to my own livelihood, but that's really the, the truth. And there's no more forest left, but because of this flash flooding, uh, with mass media, you see all those bodies, unfortunately, and in all commiseration to the victims, you know, just floating around, gross uh, uh, scenario. But it happened, as it happened uh, all over the world. So... There is hope uh, to, for uh, reforestation. People are no longer deforesting in the large scale. There's practically nothing left anyway. And what is left, the community will kill and die for it. And that's the good news. There's so much discussion, and again, because of social media. It cannot anymore be managed by businessmen like me to tell the, the anchor, I mean, the, the established media, please don't cover this, don't report about this. So, yeah, there is hope, and uh, we're, that's, we're working on that, and thanks to events like this that uh, this discussion is shared. Right. I have a question. Um, in Brazil, and with the rainforest and stuff, is the government pro-deforestation, and how are they helping, or is it the people now that are helping? Do you want to take that, Mariana? <laughs> I think that's quite a polemic discussion here, I would say. <laughs> and when you say government, there is many people in the government. So I will speak on behalf of the Minister of Agriculture, which is Teresa Cristina, women representation. And I think from the agriculture side, there is a huge concern on protecting Amazonia and, and producing it correctly. Like the ministry has created a lot of initiatives for using biological inputs, for uh, financing and providing other sorts of uh, research material so we can uh, progress in more sustainable farming systems. So I see a good, um, a, a, good a good side on the agriculture side. On the environmentalist side, then we not always come into agreement, I would say. You know, like, so Brazil presence and commitment to that has not been so active for the last government. But I wouldn't say in any terms that they are pro deforestation of the Amazonia. I just think there is different level of activity on protecting the Amazonia within the government. But besides that, as I mentioned, and I think that's what, for example, the ESG framework brings up wonderful thing to everyone, is that now everyone, every fund of investment, every private company is worried about the society and wants to change their supply chain and have social development commit, uh, the, the sustainable development commitments. So I'm glad that to see more and more companies are engaged in protecting the Amazonia and creating projects. And even I remember in Davos this year, in the beginning of the year, uh, in 2020, I even forget that year passed because like it seems it didn't, right? Uh, the Minister of Economy initiated um, an initiative with the World Economic Forum for creating like a, a study center for protecting Amazonia together, bringing tech and so on. But then again, we are an emerging country. And when we have a crisis like the pandemia, things lose a little bit of the speed, right? But the awareness raised. Yeah. Jonah, you want to jump on that? I'll just say a couple of things. Um, there has been some activity at the intergovernmental level pushing governments in response to the September 2019 Amazon fires, President mm -hmm. Ivan Duque convened the Leticia Pact and got many of the heads of state to make a renewed uh, commitment to uh, reforestation and sharing green technologies uh, and other processes. Um, there has been some evidence that uh, President Bolsonaro of Brazil is not an avid forest protection advocate. Um, he uh, has some partnership with a small set of indigenous communities, the Paresi community and sort of the um, central part of Brazil is a fan of his. They have um, 
uh, they have soy plantations that they generate income from, but it's a controversial thing because the great majority of indigenous communities uh, don't want a sort of a deforestation led type version of economic development. Um, when Bolsonaro came in, he paralyzed many of the environmental protection mechanisms. He got rid of the guy who was monitoring deforestation in the um, country's space agency. Um, he paralyzed the land regulatory system. There are a lot of other things that happened. Um, it, some of it is better now. Some of it is not better. It's complicated. So leadership on deforestation prevention has sort of been pushed down to the state and local level. Um, uh, various countries wanted to offer Brazil money to move forward on the deforestation agenda. The federal government rejected it, but the state governments raised their hands and said, no, 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 we'll work on it. There is something called the Interstate Consortium um, uh, on the Amazon. I don't have the exact name, uh, but there are seven state governors, actually nine state governors, if you include the legal Amazon, that come together on a periodic basis to work on policy opportunities. There are uh, three different global networks of subnational um, organizations that are working to push for the government agenda. Uh, one is called the Governor's Climate Enforced Task Force. Another one is called R20 or the Regions 20 of Climate Action. And the other one is the I ICLEI, which is like the International Cities for Sustainability. And they have recently created something called the Amazon Cities Pack, which is municipal governments joining forces to help a uh, a pro force friendly economic development agenda. So there's a lot happening, but it's not necessarily always visible at the national level. Nice. So, I mean, our time is almost up. What can we do to create change? How can we work together? What is the message we need to get out there? Who'd like to take that one? Okay, Edgar, but you have to unmute yourself. You have to unmute. Little red button. Sorry again about that. You know, my look uh, explain it. It's getting old. Senior moments. Uh, I just said, uh, let the Philippines uh, do it first. Um, actually, the world is already doing, but uh, in a very small scale yet. But it is my own belief that that small scale is expanding very fast. So we continue to make noise in our small way, starting with our own communities, and then people will notice, as they say, and it is our own experience in our own story, uh, because this is a unique story of a multilateral investment, multinational investment happening in our zone. And people take notice, as that movie says, if you build, they will come. Yeah, so there is hope. That, uh, we've reached a tipping point in some areas, like the Amazon, but there is hope and definitely uh, faith springs, hope springs eternal. It can be done. Wonderful. Yeah, I think the, go ahead, Helen. No, I just, I just wanted to add to that. I think it's extremely important to, to realize not only there is hope, but I think, you know, the question is, what are we going to do next? And I think um, creating the partnerships that are necessary and starting to bridge uh, the different sectors, you know, let's stop working in silos here. You know, it is important for international organizations to start working with private sector um, solutions, um, with innovators, with the youth who come up with solutions that are outside the box. And again, going back to really, consul uh, you know, consultative processes with communities. This year, we have um, the Food Systems Summit, which is a global engagement around the world to really rethink food systems. And there's been this launch for what is called independent dialogues. And the idea for once is that around the world, the maximum voices participate in this, but not just participate in terms of talking about it or saying we need to change, but actually the idea is for them to provide solutions. And I think that we just need to move now. We were talking about moving from advocacy to solutions to implementation. And we can only do that if we work together, if we start really leveraging the private sector, engaging the different um, uh, partners available and the experts to, to start implementing it and also to look at micro local, you know, solutions and the domino effect in that instead of just trying to find 
um, mass, massive solutions that are not adaptable at the local level. Um, we need to flip it around and, and, and engage people in understanding that this affects them, all of us. It affects you in Timbuktu as much as it affects you sitting in New York. And um, I think we have an opportunity to do that today. I just want to add to what Eileen has said. That's like, I, I think our main concern here is like to see scales of the pilot. So there's lots of good solutions out there, but everyone just do a pilot and then they show off the whole market saying, oh, I'm a good person and I did a nice project here. Yeah. But there's not real scalability. And for that, we need money. And there is very few resources and investments going for scaling out those solutions. I mean, like even long-term and patient capital for ag techs to continue to develop or even the budget within the big corporations. They just can finance hackathons and say they are doing innovation or then they finance a pilot, but it's very hard to see them deploying full scale in the whole supply chain and actually get